Thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, I want to also thank Matt and Mercedes for the cheeky title of my presentation. Uh, when they reached out to me last week and said, will you be okay if it's Legally Blonde with Julie Kelly? And I said, well, how about Illegally Blonde? Since I'll be talking about the DOJ's abuse of the law and power to go after Donald Trump and his supporters, so they did. So as soon as I agreed to it, I ran to the bathroom to make sure that my roots were still blonde. <laughs> Luckily, I just had a touch-up a week or so ago. Next week might not have worked, but here we are today. So uh, thank you all for coming so much. Great crowd. Um, so I'd like to start off with a question for all of you. This is what I was taught my speech communications degree from Eastern Illinois University. It's coming in handy. <clears throat> what world leader recently took the stage to address his countrymen to brag about the number of political dissidents that he and his regime have rounded up over the past few years? What world leader not only talked about the 1,200 plus countrymen that he rounded up, helped his regime, his authorities round up, arrest, charge, prosecute, but also that almost 1,000 of them had been convicted, meaning that they either were coerced into plea deals or they were convicted by a jury made up of residents of a city that shared that world leader's political views. Furthermore, who is the world leader that then stood on the stage and bragged about the number of years that those people had been sentenced to prison? 840 years, he said. Anyone know who that is? Correct. <laughs> now just imagine for a moment if that had been a world leader from any other country who had taken the stage and bragged and boasted about incarcerating people who protested against him more than three years ago. There would be international outrage like we've seen the past week or so, past few days. Um, there would be condemnations from the UN, from Amnesty International. Instead, when Joe Biden spoke those words on the three-year anniversary of January 6th at Valley Forge, no less, he was greeted with applause from those people in the audience. Presumably the same people who are now posting their grief and heartbreak and outrage over the death of Alexei Navalny in Russia. Biden's numbers, however, as he said, 1,200 Americans had been arrested and charged, already are outdated, and I'll tell you why. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Matthew Graves, who is a Biden appointee, is on pace this year to arrest a January 6th protester every day. So the total number now is up to 1,315 defendants, with Matthew Graves and the Department of Justice promising that that total caseload at the end of the day will exceed 2,000 representing an unprecedented criminal investigation and prosecution against American citizens who protested the 2020 election on January 6th. Now what Joe Biden didn't mention, and this is important, is that his Department of Justice has a 100% conviction rate in the nation's capital in jury trials against January 6th defendants. We are now two years removed from the first trial, which was March of 2022. Two years later, not one jury in Washington, D.C. has fully acquitted a January 6th defendant after more than 100 trials. Now, some of those trials have a few more, have more than one defendant. Now, the jury has acquitted defendants on some charges, but no January 6th defendant has walked out of a Washington courtroom fully exonerated by DC jury. And you know why? Because it is a city populated by Democrats that voted 92% for Joe Biden. Despite that record, federal judges of both parties in Washington continue to deny change of venue motions for January 6th defendants. 
Two years later, they know the record of the trials, what January 6th defendants have been subjected to by these juries returning these verdicts, guilty verdicts in record time. They still refuse to move these trials out of Washington, D.C. Any day of the week, and I was trying to go yesterday, but my flight was messed up. That's a whole other story. Um, any day of the week, you can go to the federal courthouse in Washington, a few blocks from the Capitol, and you can pick randomly a judge or a courtroom, and you will be able to find a court proceeding for a January 6th defendant. I often wonder, what did these judges do before January 6th? Because the docket is literally packed with January 6th cases. I don't know what they did before. I mean, we know they were going after Donald Trump and other people, but I really wonder what they did beforehand. So um, that, is the, that is the status of the January 6th, or as the Department of Justice, Matthew Graves calls it, the capital siege investigation. So this is not ending. They're continuing to arrest, charge, and convict and incarcerate Trump supporters. Quickly go through um, the trials against Donald Trump, the federal two criminal indictments that Special Counsel Jack Smith brought against Donald Trump last year. The Washington case, a four-count indictment by Jack Smith for the events of January 6th and efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Now, on hold, the March 4th trial date has been officially vacated as this moves to where it is headed, which is the Supreme Court, for the highest court to weigh in for the first time whether a former president can be subjected to criminal prosecution. Now, the reason it's at the Supreme Court is because the D.C. District Court, Obama appointee Judge Tanya Chutkin, and a three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit Appellate Court, two Biden appointees on that panel, I'm sure it was just a coincidence. They're supposed to be randomly selected. We'll see. Denied Donald Trump's claims of presidential immu of immunity from criminal prosecution. So that's where it is at the Supreme Court right now. We're waiting for the court to rule on whether they were, will hear his uh, case, and also whether they will issue a stay or a hold on the immunity ruling. If the Supreme Court does not hold, put a hold on that as they consider this unprecedented matter, then the trial proceedings in Washington, which have been on hold since December, will restart. Now, what does that mean? If the Supreme Court comes back, in the next few months, they expedite the case, they hold oral arguments, and they come down with a decision that agrees with the lower courts in Washington. That means that Donald Trump could very well go on trial as people in this country are early voting for president. And let me disabuse you, anyone who thinks that that won't happen, it will. The DOJ typically is supposed to have this policy where they don't do anything political before an election. Haha, -ha, we know that's not true. But Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, has recently said that these two cases, the one in Washington and the one in Southern Florida for classified documents, are out of his hands. They are in the judge's hands now. He has no authority to put a halt to a criminal trial against a former president and the 2024 Republican nominee for president even if that trial starts October 1st of this year. So that is something that could happen. Quickly, what's happening in Southern Florida in the classified documents case, that's getting kind of interesting. Special Counsel Jack Smith, 41 count indictment against Donald Trump and two co-defendants for keeping classified records that were created during Donald Trump's presidency, attempting to conceal not just from the public, but from Donald Trump himself, some of the records that they claim are highly sensitive and classified that he unlawfully kept at Mar-a-Lago. That trial, however, looks like, looks less and less every day that it's going to happen in 2024. Judge Aileen Cannon is about the polar opposite of Judge Chutkin, Judge Cannon, a Trump appointee, who has had Jack Smith's number for the past few years, is not acting as the rubber stamp for DOJ that uh, the Justice Department is certainly used to having in courtrooms in Washington, D.C. 
There is a little glimmer of hope I want to leave you with. I call myself the Debbie Downer of democracy. You know, everyone's excited. And then I come in and everyone's like, oh my god, we're all going to die. Um, there is a little glimmer of hope. The Supreme Court also will hold oral arguments in April on one of the DOJ's most common felonies in J6 cases, also represents half of Jack Smith's criminal indictment. That is obstruction of an official proceeding, 1512C2, a post Enron law that dealt with, dealt with document shredding, not political protests that interrupted a meeting of Congress. If the Supreme Court, and there's a good chance that they will, reverse how the DOJ has weaponized and intentionally misinterpreted the language of that statute, it will represent one of the biggest black eyes for the DOJ and federal judges in Washington, who almost uniformly except one, allow that count to go forward. And it probably poses a bigger risk to Jack Smith's indictment in Washington than anything related to presidential immunity. So I would urge you to check that out. I have some of my work on that, declassified, also real clear investigations. Wow, this time goes fast. That's why I only brought an envelope this time. Thank you all so much. I'll be around here if anyone has questions. And thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you, CPAC. Thank you.